You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. And thanks for joining us for another edition of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And we're joined by a very special guest tonight, uh, Mrs. McLean Okeson. Yeah, that's all. From Worldwide Wines, a wine specialist, <laughs> who I had the pleasure of meeting some time back at a wonderful wine tasting dinner that uh, Jacob uh, Studenroth put on at uh, Hartford Baking Company. That was fun. And uh, you guys are in for a treat tonight. We're going to be tasting five New World Wines. And uh, there's going to be a lot of debate as to how they taste and to what our opinions are on them. So I'm looking forward to it, McLean. So uh, we're not going to spend too much time gabbing because we got to start drinking. <laughs> we got a lot to go through. So I, just, well, I think, wine. Jim, your first selection tonight. <laughs> well, this is, and this is funny. Uh, I picked this one out at the store, and this is actually wine you represent this now. This is, yeah, uh, Mayu, absolutely. This is the Mayu. This is a grape varietal called Pedro Jimenez. Uh, and typically, this grape is used for making sherry. Uh, you, you get a very intensely sweet, dark sherry from this. Um, and it was deemed unsuitable as a table wine because it has such low acidity. But there was a, a vineyard in Chile who figured out how to do this. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, as far as I know, is the only white table wine you'll find made from the Pedro Jimenez grape. It's very unusual. Yeah. yeah. And actually, very tasty. <laughs> just for our viewers, what exactly is, what, what do they mean when they say a new world wine? Anything North America, South America, uh, you could throw Australia into that group. Basically um, anything outside of Europe. Yeah. So I, I sometimes I argue that Spain has some New World tendencies, but it's basically uh, it, geographic, and then you can also kind of play around with uh, using those terms and for styles of wines. Yeah, it's a New which, World flair, yeah. or it's an old school. It's a you know it, maybe it's a uh, an Oregon Pinot Noir that's a little more old world. So I think it's both geography and yeah. That, I think style. it is starting to shift now that it's it's more of the winemaking style. Mm -hmm. You know, are you are you trying to follow the traditional way of making the wine that the, the French have done and the Italians have done? Or are you trying to make it more like the California style? Exactly. Uh, which I think we'll find in the uh, the matchmaker Vignet, yeah. which uh, is actually a, an old grape that uh, the new new world twist. A new world twist, <laughs> absolutely. All right, so uh, let's give this let's a shot. Let's start off. This chin is the chin. Mayu. Chin chin. I don't get much aroma right off the bat there. No, you don't. Although, you know, I, I get a little acidity with this, which I was not expecting mm -hmm. uh, reading the notes on this. I was expecting very low acidity wine. Uh, Bob and I just did a, a show uh, last month on low acidity wines. Ah. And I was expecting this to compare to um, some of the French versions we had um, you know, the, the, that had almost no acidity at all. Yes. Th this is actually kind of surprising because I just get a kick of grapefruit. Mm -hmm. Really quick, and mm -hmm. then it fades right yeah. away. But uh, I, I actually sort of like this, I think. It's only my first sip, so i got to try another one just to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of those wines where it doesn't really fit in any other category. And we have a couple of wines that are a little bit like that. I think the, the next white will be in that, kind of, that, that demographic as well. Um, so say, well, what, what does that taste like? You, you can't really compare it to anything else. It's just kind of its own... Its own animal. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. thing. Well, if you're trying to... <clears throat> Picture, picture a, a flavor profile for this first wine. Um, I really only get a grapefruity mm -hmm. kick right mm -hmm. off the bat. I, I don't really catch a lot of other flavors there, but I like that. I'll say it's maybe a little more akin to Sauvignon Blanc. I was just going to say the same yeah. thing. It's, yeah, it's got a know. little bit of the, the citrus from Sauvignon mm -hmm. Blanc, and I, I get a little bit of minerality from this too. But it's Tad not, bit, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. not overpowering at all. But actually, that's good because uh, you, this show is going to be out in March. It's going to be close to spring, if not spring yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This <laughs> I think would be a good start to a yeah, spring wine. Great spring I think. wine. Mm -hmm. So not overly complex. I hate to say it, but it's it's a really cool packaging too. It's just kind of one of those wines. Just I don't know. I love what they've Jumps done. Out oh, at you yeah, it's shelf, really yeah. you know. It's, I I always it's tell our, our audience don't buy a wine based on the label, but you know they they create these labels to jump out at you like that. And, and probably when it's Pedro Jimenez, need a little need a little help into the hand of the consumer. But um, yeah, this is super tasty. And you said you just started 
selling. Yeah, it. it's uh, it's part of uh, one of our suppliers named uh, Vine Connections, and they have a whole new uh, range of wines called New Chile. Uh, so they, they really do work with uh, family-owned wineries uh, who usually practice sustainable. It's a little bit easier to do that um, uh, down in Chile. Um, but the wines have <laughs> all been great. So it's kind of exciting that, it, that wine made it here. So. I, it was just, yeah, chance that yeah. I ended up <laughs> <laughs> bringing one of your bottles. <laughs> and really, That's quick, great. before we move to the next one, is it a small vineyard or is it a large vineyard? Do they produce a lot of bottles? Not a ton. Um, I would say I mean, mid-range. So we're not talking worldwide domination kind of production. Which is good. Which is good. But enough, you know, that we get some kind of continuity. And like I said, if, if you see these wines um, out and about, uh, I said grab them because they've been really good so far. So we're really happy to be selling them now. I think we kicked it off maybe like yep. last month. So, and the price point relatively uh, ten to fifteen dollars, and that's locally here in yep. uh, Connecticut. This area. I got this at the Wise Old Dog. Oh, so. there you go. I was there for that sale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was thinking, who else carries this? <laughs> well, I'm going to give this one a thumbs up to start off. I am too. So thumbs up. Yep. Three thumbs up for the first wine tonight. Easy breezy. So far, so good. Now, McLean, the next one is you. Right. So this is uh, a wine called Crios. Uh, it is 100% Tarantes. And Tarantes is a grape that's really not grown anywhere outside of Argentina. It's kind of unusual. Uh, its hallmarks is that it's very aromatic. And uh, so it kind of like Savion Blanc and Viognier made a baby, basically. So a little bit of acid, uh, beautiful to drink, very springy, and lots of aromatics on the nose. The Crios kind of means growth. So on the label, you'll see a hand within a hand. Within a hand. And so she's two children, and so that's her hand with her children's hand. They're now grown, but um, Susanna Balboa is really the, the first lady of Argentine Malbec. So this is, this is her flagship line of wines. Her Malbec is fabulous. I almost brought that. But the Tarantes has always been a stunner. I, it's so floral. I, yeah. Usually you get a floral note off of a wine, but you don't have that floral taste. Uh, but this carries through from, from the aromatics into oh, uh, sure the does. flavor profile. Yeah, once it's on your tongue, it's just... It's almost like Gewurz. Exactly. Right? Yes. It's a, yeah. kind of like lychee fruit and white flowers. and But um, it, it's balanced. It, it, the aromatics uh, don't translate to any kind of sweetness. Actually, it's dry. I think there's it a little minerality mm -hmm. on the finish. And actually, after the winter we've had, this is actually a pretty good oh, choice it's because it's got the yeah. floral, it's got some of the fruit. So this it is just, sort of... Uh, it just makes you think of spring, doesn't it? It does, and believe me, we all need to think of spring after <laughs> the winter we've had here. This is really good. I, I must say that the aromatics are really impressing me right off the bat. I mean, it's really nice. Yeah, and um, you know, a couple of years ago, this got some great press uh, from the New York Times. They did a, an article about Tarantes as a grape and how the quality is steadily increasing and uh, the wines are more available in the U.S. So it's kind of this little known thing and so... Um, now Creos has a uh, Malbec Rosé. They do. Also. I, that they was another do. one I considered bringing tonight. <laughs> that would have been, that would have been perfect. <laughs> I, I, I like our rosés. Yeah. yeah, and I, I was just thinking, gosh, I hope I get invited back for one of the rosé segments uh, because I, I, I love drinking rosé all year round. Of course. And when you have something uh, like Malbec as your as your, your raw material for rosé. It's a little more of a winter rosé. It's transitional, it has a little more weight. Mm -hmm. You're having, yeah. um, eating chili on the weekend, um, hibernating. It just has a little, more, a little more weight, which I like. But so. I'm, I'm glad to know, McLean, that you also agree that you can drink rosé all 24 year. 7. Yes. yes. Absolutely. And uh, we've been trying to push that right. for how many years now? How many years have we been doing the show? Almost four. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, buy the rosés, try them. You're going to like them. And I've only seen um, sales and interest in rosés grow over the last couple of years. I mean, from, from all over down from uh, like Richmond, Virginia to, to up here. And so um, we recently took out our uh, rosé pre-sale and we pre-sold in the first week like 2,000 cases of rosé. Mm. So people kind of try new things, they get attached, they, they wait for the new release to come out. Um, though, you know, we do kind of talk about that the Southern Hemisphere rosés really uh, come out a little sooner, which is great for us. So. Well, I'm just glad to know there's a resurgence there because uh, the, the market needed it because there's so many good rosés mm -hmm. and uh, th there's a lot of varietals out there. So, um. Yeah, Bob and I hosted an event a couple of years ago and, and featured a rosé. We had a lineup of wines, but yeah. we featured a rosé and we were pushing people towards it and couldn't get anybody to take it. They just and thought Zinfandel. So yeah, that was yeah. it's, it's exactly. the curse, curse of the white I, I think if we did that same event today, 
We get a few more takes. And I even pushed it. It was a French rosé. It's not an American. It's a French mm. rosé. Yeah. Nice bottle. It didn't work, McLean. It didn't work. <laughs> Keep trying. Yeah, we have I, fight I, the good fight. <laughs> all right. But uh, this particular, I really like this a lot. This is really good. It's uh, certainly um, can hold its own um, with a lot of different food, especially like a spicy food. And I was thinking like I had Indian, really good Indian the other night, and um, this would have been perfect uh, because you, you have um, beautiful fruit to kind of balance out. Uh, spiciness, the aromatics. Mm -hmm. and you you're eating, uh, especially Indian food, uh, just cardamom and just I think it's a beautiful marriage there. Well, another positive. Thumbs yeah, up. thumbs right. up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was easy. And once again, <laughs> everything we're drinking tonight is considered a, a new world wine. Yes. So. Yeah. Oh, and, and the and price, price range this yeah. is um, between like thirteen and seventeen. Okay. Yeah. All right, now we're going to an interesting one. Uh, we've done a few of them, maybe one or two over the years. We've had a few viognets. Viognets, and um, I actually like them. I think, unlike a Chardonnay, they're a little bit more complex. They can have a little bit mm -hmm. more, um, they, can, they can sort of taste better, at least from my palate, than a buttery Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of, I've had this once or twice in the past. Unfortunately, I can't remember if I liked it or not. <laughs> so because we're Third doing time's a charm. <laughs> New World uh, wine tonight, and we're doing an old grape that's manufactured in the New World. I thought, why not give it another shot? Well, and Vignet gets a little overlooked. You know, people are always concentrating on either Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc, and I think, I think you know, Vignet is a good option. People just don't think of it here. And it's also a complex yeah. grape to do correctly because it's very easy if the winemaker doesn't have a lot of skill to sort of lose a lot of the complex flavors that are in the Acidity, grape. Acidity is a tough battle. It's one of those grapes that uh, comes to physiological ripeness very quickly. So you can have Viognier that will just climb to 17% alcohol by the end of your fermentation process. Mm -hmm. So you have to really have a, a deft hand. Um, very much so, yeah. yeah. And actually, just uh, for our viewers who like history, I think this is considered like one of the oldest ancient grapes. I think uh, originally started in what is current present-day Croatia, and I think the Romans, sense, yeah. the Romans brought it uh, to the Rhone area yeah. a thousand years ago. So you're drinking history when you're drinking mm -hmm. this. Oh, so. like that. All right, let's give this one a shot. Yeah. I already dove in. <laughs> Jim is done with this. I've, yeah, I finished mine already. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> now I get a little buttery sensation off of mm -hmm. this, uh, which is reminiscent of Chardonnay. I don't get the but, butter. That's no? interesting. Well, everybody's palate's a little different. Yep. I wonder if they um, they do a little bit of lee stirring, something you can do to add some texture um, without uh, like that secondary like malolactic fermentation or wood. You know, I think um, there's something going on there, like beautiful kind of creamy mouthfeel. Yes, there is a little creaminess. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's definitely there's the mineral aspect of it too. Yeah, it's um, lovely. But I mean, if I didn't, if this was a covered tasting we're doing that. I would never think this was a Chardonnay. And, so, I, and I, have to, I, wouldn't. I have to admit, I'm a little bit prejudiced because when I first saw it, I was like. California Viognier, like I'm probably gonna hate this, and then I, I really like it, and also the alcohol level is is very moderate. It's, it's 13 and change, I think. So in that kind of 13 to 14 realm percentage, and it's it's kind of unusual, I think, because it's things just grow in California, and you have to kind of rein it in sometimes. But what's funny, McLean, I'm glad I know I brought something that you hated when you first saw, <laughs> and you went in with an open mind to taste it because that's why I did it because because like you said, like I said, the research I've done on. Uh, Vignet and so forth. It's it is a very complex grape to do correctly, and uh, you know this was a shot that I took, and it paid off so far. So yeah, it's actually, all three of our wines have paid yeah. off so far. Oh, good job! Right. And the the Torrantes is also difficult to work with. I did a little bit of reading before the show, and and read that it's it's so full of protein that they have a difficult time crushing it, and then they have to clarify it it's afterwards. A, it's a tricky little grape. Um, so you don't really see a lot in blends necessarily, but uh, I think we'll con uh, continue to see growth and people's interest grow in, in this kind of oddball grape. I hope so. I, it was a fantastic wine. Okay, thanks. And actually, uh, for our viewers, again, who've been watching us over the years, you'll notice that we're drinking whites in a progression here that make a little, make sense because we're starting off with the whites working into the reds. And I think we set them up so we're starting with a lighter white, moving into a little bit more heavier white. Mm -hmm. And now that we're going to be going to the reds, a Pinot, Pinot Noir is going to be on the little bit lighter side. Um, before we finish off with a, a real star tonight. So, should we go right to the Pinot Noir? Let's, Let's do, do it. it. All right. Jinx. <laughs> so, so our viewers who may or may not know their wine, uh, Oregon produces some really great world-class Pinot, Pinot, Pinot Noirs. And uh, it's a full to medium-bodied wine. It tends to be uh, very easy to drink. Uh, very nice flavor profile. Oregon has some great wines in general. There's a wide variety of quality, though, and uh, like anything else. So, just because it's from Oregon and it's a Pinot Noir doesn't mean it's always going to be good. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm going into this one blind. Uh, we're in West Hartford, so you'll notice there's a little dog here. So uh, I know there's a lot of dog lovers in West Hartford. So <laughs> that drove me to try the little rascal. I think so that's you, their you mascot. Just because of the label. <laughs> Yes and no. Uh, hey, I got to play to my audience. You, <laughs> broke, the, you broke the rule. I'm playing to the audience. But um, once again, it's, it's a Pinot Noir has really light characteristics, especially yeah. you know depending on how you're going to pair, or even in the spring and summertime. It's one of my favorite reds, actually. It's nice, and Oregon uh, Pinot Noir is really. I can't even say up and coming. It's it's so established now. Yeah. And I think I think the tricky thing can be the price point, um, because you can have a general, you know, Oregon Appalachian, and then you see Willamette, and then you know you're into that more specific, that very special. It's like buying a California Cabernet versus a Napa Cabernet. You know, there's certain kind of standards of quality mm -hmm. and 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 rigors and and price adjustments for that more specific appellation. Yeah, I think the Willamette Valley is also comparable to uh, Burgundy, I believe, right? The uh, yeah, the, the I think um, yeah, and also like. Uh, like latitude, I think. I yes, guess. the latitude. So, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Similar. Well, that's why it does so well there. Yeah. It, We've had, I think uh, Eli was on the show once, and he had a really good um, Pinot Noir on. Uh, We've had a couple of good Oregon Pinot Noirs. And, uh, and once again, it's one of those states where I've had mm -hmm. everything I've tasted, at least on the show, has been pretty good. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you like your lights or you like your reds a little on the lighter side, but still have some complexity, uh, this is a good choice for the price point. I mean, um, you can get pretty stratospheric prices for an Oregon good quality oh, yes. Pinot Noir. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is under $17. So um, between $14 and $17, I think you get a pretty good idea of what a Pinot Noir should or shouldn't taste like in this one. So. Yeah, it's got like, you know, nice cherry notes and some baking spices and kind of medium bodied. And they say a good Pinot Noir should be just as compelling as a fine French red Burgundy. So a little story about Burgundy. Uh, Burgundy's been having a really, a really tough go. Um, we had a lot of hail over the last couple of vintages. And so uh, what we've seen is, um, uh, and, and a lot of our producers, we have some, some big houses, so to speak, from mm -hmm. Burgundy that we represent, but we also have some small producers and, and they just got nailed. They, you know, some, um, some were decimated about 50% for their crop. So we see prices continue to rise and it makes me so sad because Burgundy is, is sometimes difficult to understand, not as accessible. Um, even the grapes seem pretty straightforward, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And so, you know, consumers are tending to look elsewhere. You, know, you talk about it not being straightforward. You're talking about all the different little villages and subsets of villages that are exactly. producing wines. And, and, and you don't, the fact that it's red burgundy, but that you don't, it doesn't say burgundy, it says, you know, Jeffrey Chambertin mm -hmm. or something like that. And it's a, that you just have to know and it's, it's, it's very French. It's, but, um, yeah, it's very difficult for the American consumer to figure out what they're buying when they're looking at Burgundy. And I'm not talking and, anybody out of Burgundy. I'm just... <laughs> no. <they're laughs> that, would, that would be a sin. But, mm. you know, when it's it's really tough, it's Burgundy's gotten really expensive because of all the all the crop problems. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's good to have wines like this in your back pocket. If you're a Burgundy lover. Yeah, that's Because there is, like I so said, they're very similar yeah. in the flavor profile. But uh, I'm going to give this one a thumbs up, too. And I, I'm not just being biased because I brought it in. Just a little bit biased. <laughs> just a little bit. But I like this No, I, I think this encapsulates, encapsulates everything that a Pinot Noir should be. You know, it's, it's got uh, a great body. It's, it's, you know, usually Pinot Noirs, the bad ones, tend to be too light, in my yes, opinion. Yes, almost and too so watery. This, this is, uh, it's not a heavy wine, but it's, it's heavy for a Pinot Noir. This would be uh, great with like a fatty piece of salmon. You know, because yes. I, so I like the earthiness um, that you, you kind of get with salmon, and this has weight, so it's you know you can do you know, plenty of white meats, and and I think you can go the other direction and do fish too. There's just enough there to pair with a lot of different stuff, or just drink on its own. It's not too simple. There's enough, just enough complexity there to talk about, mm -hmm. which is always good for wine. You want to be able to talk about it and just say, eh, that was no big deal. Let's move on." So, Oregon born still going to give it a thumb up, thumbs up. Yeah. Right. So the star of this evening is a, mm. uh, we're very fortunate that McLean was generous enough to bring it in. I can't wait to hear about this one. So this is a, I'm blushing already. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is a, a wine called uh, Andrew Murray. He's a person. <laughs> He's a winemaker in Santa Barbara. And he is uh, what you call a, a Roan Ranger. And a Roan Ranger is an organization of California winemakers, wineries, who specialize or are advocates of Rhone Valley grapes. So we talked about the Rhone Valley mm -hmm. for Viognier, so you see a little bit of, the, of that production. Um, a lot of Syrah, 
though. There's, I think, maybe five or six years ago, I was so sure California Syrah was just going to take off because the price of cab continued to climb, but Malbec kind of slid into home base there. So it's still, um, California Syrah is really underrated, and so you can drink great Syrah at a great price. And um, It's probably also a good time to buy some when mm -hmm. the price is just a reason before it does take off. And uh, so uh, Andrew Murray has been in the business a long time. Um, he's, he's young. He's uh, in his like, early 40s. And when he was in his 20s, uh, Robert Parker called him kind of the shining star of the Santa Barbara firmament um, in, the, in the winemaking scene. And so you get that kind of praise. You could let like, go to your head or maybe uh, go work for a, a larger winery. But uh, he did the opposite. Pretty small production, mostly Syrah a little bit of fabulous rosé, um, and a couple whites. So uh, he actually uh, came into the area, and I got to meet him. And uh, we had dinner with our mutual supplier over at Firebox in Hartford, And because um, they pour their Pinot Noir there. His Pinot Noir does a little bit of that as well. And he's so, he's so down to earth, the coolest guy. You know, he talks about his family, and he you know, talks about the vines. And so you feel good about meeting the person behind the wine and knowing the care Absolutely. that's put into it. So this is considered to be, they practice sustainably. So that just means, you know, you've got good bugs eating bad bugs and you've got, you know, goats and you encourage bees to kind of propagate the, the property. And so he's doing everything right. Um, this is 100% Syrah. It's called tout le jour, which just means all the day, as in you can just Drink this all Drink day. Drink it all day long. Drink yes. it all day long. <laughs> and I do notice he signed your bottle. On the I begged. I didn't have to beg. He was a sweetheart. I was embarrassed. But it says it says rock and roan, uh, which is perfect because he, as as when he was younger, he was really into like big hair '80s bands. And so he has a line of wines uh, called This is Eleven, based off of uh, This is Spinal Tap. Oh, yeah. You ever see the yeah, mockumentary? Yes. Mm -hmm. anyway, Turn it up to 11. That's a whole other yeah. show. <laughs> it is another show. Yeah, it's another show. Um, and so this little wine, this is 2013 vintage. It, it's really young still, has a lot of concentration. Um, but this got great press. It uh, got a 93 point rating from uh, Galoni, um, mm -hmm. who's now kind of out, out in zone doing his own ratings um, under Venice. So. And you said Robert Parker had good things to say about this also. Exactly. And he's one of the few wine critics who can make or break a vineyard. Exactly. Uh, you know, if he, he gives it a good review, sales typically go through the roof. Oh, I love this. So, wow, it's kind of yeah, I, I, high Yeah, I was waiting to finish, but oh, wow. wow. This, is, um, this is one of those reds where mm. you, you, it hits you yep. and then it coats you. As yeah, it goes it's down. so concentrated. It mm -hmm. is. It's fantastic. So what I look for in California mm. Syrah, because I love um, I love Northern Rhone, where they primarily uh, they like really only work with Syrah, and the Southern Rhone, which is blended Grenache and Syrah. But there's a kind of um, a bloody quality, uh, a meaty kind of quality you can get on the nose, and that reminds me of Northern Rhone. So there's a little bit on this, but there's a lot of a lot of generous fruit, some like candy blackberries. Um, it's just kind of a mouthful. Um, it's, it's really, and he has some single vineyard Syrah as well. Um, and again, we're going to get some of his rosé, uh, which is fabulous, too. You know, I just tried a little green. piece of, uh, of cheese with it, and uh, oh, yeah. it even, it, it, it's so lush. So lush. I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm not sure what the price point of this, but um, I, I would assume if I didn't know, even though I think I do, this would be $35, $40 for it's, a bottle. Um, <laughs> you would think it's, it's between $13 and $17, the same price as wow. the rest of the wines. So. That's pretty amazing. So this is, this is something, um, I, I don't... This, this is not one of the wines that I kind of have to sell in my job, that I, that I love to sell, that I choose to sell, that I want to advocate. So it's really great when someone who's a, a great person, a great winemaker, gets, gets some good press. Mm -hmm. You know, and the wine's yeah. great and it's so underpriced and you just you want to encourage people to go buy it while they can because eventually we'll, people will catch on and I'm sure... And what year know. was this? 2013. So that's this current release for us. So we got a little, a little bit more Beautiful color, too. Yeah. It's a, I need a little food. You know, this is a lot of... I'm a lighter wine drinker in general, but, you know. It's a lot to take in all of its own. Yeah, this is, uh, I'm glad we finished off with this one tonight because it really, uh, it was a great progression and uh, the complexity of this particular red. A little bit of grip, yeah. kind of overwhelming. Uh, just kinda, grip, that's a great word, yeah. absolutely. Did you try a piece of the cheese with it? No. I don't know. Sometimes we, yeah, sometimes we can eat on the show, sometimes <laughs> we can. Sometimes the, the, the chewing gets picked up on the microphone, so that's right, yeah. So in progression tonight, if we had to pick the best white, 
Oh, is it? Can I you do that? It's not as fair. Not fair. fair. We, we've liked everything tonight. So we shouldn't pick anything and best. Now you right? want to make somebody look bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot yeah. of thumbs up. You know, I, I like the whites for different reasons. I think yes. the Pedro Jimenez is so different, and that is like, show up for a dinner party with that, and cool label, cool story, great juice. The backstory is fantastic. I, I love it. How can you, it's unique. You show up to a party and say, oh, this, this is a wine that wouldn't, it wouldn't exist yeah. if it weren't for one man's vision. And the Creos, and, you know, female winemaker, uh, little known grape, um, just, uh, and just, God, it tastes like spring, and I cannot wait. I cannot wait for spring. Yeah. Well, you just show up to the party with the three of us, and you have a great party. That's right? <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> right. So you're right. I shouldn't try to pick the best one tonight, I mean, because everyone was good in their own unique way. They're pretty different, so. but, you know, just... You know, our remaining few minutes of the show, McLean, is there anything that's really big right now for you guys at Worldwide Wine? I mean, what's uh, what's happening? What's... What's, what's big and sparkling right now? Oh, bubbles. Um, I, I love bubbles. So bubbles are a, a, not just a holiday thing. Um, they're an all-year thing. Um, Bob and I drink bubbles all the time. This is, a match, this is a match made in heaven. I yes. knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, you know, I would still say uh, Prosecco sales are, are still kind of on the rise. Uh, we've got a couple of great Cavas, which is yeah. still kind of underrated. I think you'd still find a great bottle for the under 20. Um, and for real champagne, I, there's just something about actual champagne, and I'm I'm learning that I'm willing to pay a certain amount to have the real stuff. So I I've that would be for special occasions. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I wish I could drink champagne all day long. It's it's one of those tough ones because it's, it's a lot of people for champagne. It's all about or the or sparkling. It's about the bubbles, the fineness of it, the effervescence of it. And uh, we've tasted some sparklings that had very fine effervescence mm -hmm. qualities to them that can be very confusing to people who well, like only champagne. Yeah, and the, the bubbles kind of skew your perception of the wine underneath, and that's kind of also what you're looking for, I think, to a point, you know? And uh, most mm -hmm. times I find myself preferring a Prosecco or a Cava yeah. over a champagne. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else is going on. I, I'd say rosé. Rosé, rosé, because it's this will air in March, and it's not too soon to start looking for 2014 rosés. All the Southern Hemisphere rosés have kind of been released. So rosés from Chile, from South Africa, um, I don't see a ton kind of coming coming out of Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, you don't. No, not, not particularly. Um, mm, obviously, no. Argentina, Creos makes a fabulous. The Malbec Rosé. Yeah. We're going to so have to have you back on the show. You bring that rose one. Rosé class. And, yeah, we'll do, a, we'll do a whole rosé. Yeah, class. and I, I, I'm getting the uh, wrap up here, and I just wanted to say, McLean, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. I knew it was going to go by fast with, uh, well, with five really fast. wines. As it always yeah. does. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank you again for bringing some great selection. Jim, as it's always, great selection. And uh, I know you'll be heading back up to Boston probably tomorrow and with all that snow. Uh, well, Oof. I'll be looking for some great wines. I, I, <laughs> please so do. I can, I can hunker down in the house and drink them. Mm -hmm. So as always, <laughs> no, check us out on Facebook. And uh, Jim is uh, trying to get more shows up on it. Uh, uh, we'll have some more shows up on YouTube very soon, um, but if you have a question or comment for the show, please friend us on Facebook and uh, we'll address that here on the show. Absolutely, and uh, thanks again. I, like I said, hope everybody's going to have a great spring because we need it here, especially here in Connecticut after the winter we've had. And until next time, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep all of us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.